Number 10, watch party. Marriage. Nothing like legally tying yourself to another human being for the rest of your life. Everyone loves a good wedding, but if I was invited to one in the Middle Ages, well, you can count me out of the final event. You see, it was popular at the time to prove your marriage is legit, and one way of doing that was consummating it. But we can't just take your word for it, don't be silly, no. Instead, every member of your family, and maybe some members of the court if you're royal, will come with you into the bedchamber to spectate and make sure the deed is done. Imagine being the lady who would sometimes be carried to the chamber by her family members. Now, obviously, things were a little different then. Marriages were not really a thing of love. It was strictly business. And of course, they had different ideas of what exactly was private. So this is purely from our modern point of view, but I can imagine it was particularly uncomfortable having your least favorite cousin in the room. Number nine, Ivan the Terrible, the first Tsar of Russia. A man who was as cold and brutal as the winters that surrounded him. Ivan had it rough growing up. Both of his parents pulled a Bruce Wayne and passed away when he was very young. Afterwards, he and his siblings were not raised the best. Once described as having nothing but rags to wear, which in that climate must have been awful. So, did little Ivan grow up to be a super rich yet dark hero bent on serving the criminals of the night cold justice? Just like his Gotham counterpart? No, no he did not. He became wealthy, but awful. Terrible, some might say. There are a hundred stories about Ivan and his cruelty, but my favorite is that of St. Basil Cathedral. You know the one. Anytime Russia is shown on TV, it's like a North Pole Christmas Onion Palace looking thing. You know the one I'm talking about. After it was completed, he had the architect's eyes gouged out so no one could ever build anything more beautiful. <sighs> Number eight. Red card. Actually, I doubt anyone was given a red card when they played soccer back in the day. It would have just been too difficult to even determine who it was exactly that got the card. The rules of the medieval precursor to soccer were pretty, um, basic. There basically weren't any. In Shrove Tide football, the goals could be a couple hundred yards to miles apart. There were an unlimited number of players, and the only rule literally says that you could use any means necessary to score apart from the actual ending of someone's life. It still happened though, even by accident, because you take every man from your village or even from two different opposing villages and you take one leather bladder ball and say, do whatever you can to score. People are gonna get punched, kicked, stomped on, trampled, bruised, bloodied, and de-lifed. This mob football was hated by lords and kings. Edward II, Edward III, Richard II, and Henry IV all tried to have it banned, but, well, have you ever met a football or soccer fan? Number seven, human decorations. Sticking with the theme of crazy dudes from Europe comes one of the craziest, Vlad the Impaler. Sure, Ivan was bad, but imagine being so bad, so awful, that your alias is a verb for what you do to people. So specific. For example, Adam would be Adam the talker during movies. Ugh, worse. Or Adam the bedwetter. Not that I've ever wet the bed or anything. <laughs> Don't even ask. Don't ask my mom. What? Well, Vlad has this weird knack for decorating. The enemies of his kingdom would meet a terrible fate. Think of how bad a toothpick would hurt if someone poked you with it. Okay, now imagine it's a large, sharp wood pike that some lovely gentleman would sit you on. Ugh. As you slowly become one with the pike, you look around and see a field of others who have also met the same fate. The sky turns blood red. Black thick clouds form as the moon beams through and shines down on the beast of a man who would dare do this to his people. Vlad the Impaler, a man who did unspeakable things and was the inspiration for Dracula. Who knew, right? Who thought? Who, who, who thought? Number six, body on trial. And where were you on the night of April the 27th? You see, members of the jury, his stunned silence only proves his guilt. Pope Stephen VI was an interesting guy, but I think the most interesting thing he may have done was in 897 when he ordered Pope Formosus, the last guy in his position, dug up and put on trial. What's worse than digging up a dude and yelling at him in a courtroom, finding him guilty, taking away his papal finery and a few fingers, and then reburying him? Digging him back up again and throwing him in the Tiber River. Apparently, the whole thing was possibly a way of covering up the crimes that Pope Stephen had committed because, you see, this guy was one of the first popes to bring on what people call the most corrupt era in the history of the papacy. This pope didn't last too long, thanks to some unsurprising mob justice. 
And the next guy who became Pope, thankfully, outlawed the whole mortal husk on trial thing. Number five. War! What is it good for? Absolutely nothing. Say it again. War! What is it good for? Well, if you need oil, it actually kind of works out. Yes, it's warm, it's bad, it's naughty, and we've been doing it forever. I haven't gonna do more specifics, but I'll save that for a part two maybe, we'll see. I'm talking more about the brutality of medieval combat. Swords, shields, spears, pikes, halberds, axes, hammers, maces, bows, crossbows, catapults, trebuchets, rams, fire arrows, and if you're a fan of Ocarina of Time, ice arrows. I'm not sure how that works, but Link's magical, we'll go with it. The truth is, medieval combat was brutal, walking miles to every battle, sometimes with limited supplies, which meant sometimes armies pissed Village. Mm hmm yeah, not nice. If you were injured in battle, there was a high chance that you would get infected. And then that's picture wrap for you. It's a time of knights and glory, but also a time of great war and loss. All a guy can hope for is that whatever knight is gonna cut me up like a sushi roll, well, at least I'd hope he had the decency to disinfect his weapons with their favorite brand of disinfectant. Come on, let's be serious here. Number four, not the kitties. We all know that apparently black cats are bad luck, and that two of them in a row signifies a glitch in the matrix. You have Pope Gregory IX to thank for that. In 1232, Greg wrote Vox in Rama, which supposedly exposed the rituals of a cult of witches that lived in northern Germany. Among some of the things they summoned, including the big red with horns himself, was a black cat that appeared to be kissed and adored by the worshippers. The Great Cat. You've already heard of witch hunters, well now you've heard of cat hunters. People took the great cat mentioned in Vox and Rama and applied that idea to every cat. And they did not hold back, like at all. The cat population almost got to extinction point. Didn't work out too well for them when rat populations saw a huge increase not too much later though, huh? Touch my cat and you ain't making it to tomorrow, that's all I'm saying. Number three, criminal cook-off. Criminals, they're everywhere and have been since the dawn of time. It also seems that since the dawn of time, people have been coming up with lots of different ways to deal with said criminals. One of the medieval favorites of the Holy Roman Empire was boiling criminals in oil. Nice! Save for the truly heinous crooks and those who dare defraud coinage. Yes, that's right, don't dare fraud the coin or you could end up like last night's suckling duck. Boiling oil was even used in defense during castle sieges. Get too close to the walls and, well, you'd get a boiling barrel of Crisco's finest as hair grease. Boiling oil leaves horrible burns and is extremely painful. I don't know, I shouldn't have to tell you that. If you ever cook bacon without a shirt on, then you know. The kind of grit you need to stay close to that sizzling pan, I, I envy you. Because yeah, those things totally relate though, absolutely. Number two, Pope Not So Innocent the Third. Look, I'm sorry I'm talking about Pope so much, but you gotta know that a heck of a lot of horrible things that happened in the Middle Ages were caused by the decisions of the church, and specifically, that one little decision of forcefully dealing with anyone who disagrees or insults your religion. For example, in 1209, there was a group of heretics called the Cathari in southern France who believed that the Roman Catholic Church itself was established by the same people who brought an end to the life of Christ. Now, that didn't really fly too well with Pope Innocent III, who in response launched the Albigensian Crusade that became a 20 year long full military campaign. A particular event that's worthy of mention here is when the Crusaders took the town of Toulouse. The soldiers couldn't figure out who the heretics were among the people there, so Commander Simone de Montfort said, destroy them all, the devil will know his own. That's messed up, dude. Number one, something going around. Another warfare related one here, but this one is just awful. I'll make this one brief. Basically, you got a castle that needs entering or a palace that needs a good siege. You get your catapults ready, you load them up with the secret sauce. And by that, I mean these bad boys were loaded with the latest commoners who had succumbed to the bubonic plague. Yes, they were launching plague bodies over walls in hopes that it would make the enemy sick. And sometimes they would even fling some poop over there. Oof. It's such a smart move though, right? It's just so heinous and gross. When it was all said and done, I bet there was no hand washing to be found. Disgusting. Number 10, medical treatment. Honestly, up until about 1945, medical treatment methods were just, they're just awful. Like, you'll find out later in this list, infections were pretty serious. We also know that there was some quackery afoot. Doctors gave treatments that worked and some, well, they just didn't. I however think the worst of the worst was surgery. Any surgery, no anesthetic. 
Okay, so maybe someone removing a boil might not be that bad, but a very common procedure back in the day was amputation. Whether it was a grievous war injury, sickness, or an accident, when a limb needed to be lobbed off, it was going to suck. Bone, muscle, arteries, tendons, just, oh boy, all the juicy stuff that makes me lightheaded. And what makes all the horror fans shriek at night with the light. Say what you will about healthcare now, but just be thankful it ain't that. Number nine, body carrier. Go to school, get a job, work, and live. It's simple. Here in the Western world, you got options. Maybe you want to be a doctor, a pilot, or maybe even a lawyer. Johnny Depp needs your help right now, so maybe maybe be a lawyer. Call him up. Say, Johnny, I can help you. Well, someone who could have used the help was the body collector. During medieval times, diseases were a big problem. The main culprit, of course, being the Black Plague. Folks were going belly up, left, right, and center. The body collector's job was to literally collect the people who perished in their homes and the streets and bring them outside the city. Boy, what a lovely sight, and like I said, the corpses were carried outside of the city. What's more disturbing than that is it was done because there was no space to bury them. Too many. And for them, they didn't think it was an issue of germs and hygiene. They just did it because there wasn't enough room. Oh. If you want to ruin your lunch, Google search images of Black Plague symptoms. Yucky. No good. Gross. Don't like it. Number 8. Ill-equipped. On more of a macro scale here, but back in medieval times, if you were a peasant, you were expected to fight for your lord whenever called upon. Whether that's resisting foreign invaders or fighting the neighboring towns, whose lords didn't show up to your lord's birthday party, that was a good joke, Adam wrote that one, you had to be there whether you wanted to be or not. Joining up with the army in modern times could lead you to learn useful skills and could be a great career choice, it could be. But back then, the lords who forced you to fight for them were just terrified of you, so they taught you nothing, supplied you with no weapons, forcing you to use whatever farming tools really you had at home, and your military camps were so basic, more people probably bit the dust from getting sick than really going into battle. It wasn't a good time, I can tell you that. Number seven, war of the bucket. One could make the argument that war is useless, pointless, an act of brutality and waste. Well, two towns in Italy would tell you to move out of the way because somebody stole our bucket. Yes, that's right. To make a very long story short, at this time and place in Europe, there was a ton of political strife, especially through the Pope and the Holy Roman Emperor. All this nonsense boiled down to two towns, Bologna and Modena. Sounds like baloney, but it's Bado I think it's Bologna. Anyway, the towns were close and supported different political beliefs, one supporting the emperor, one supporting the pope, and it, they were feuding. And eventually, they would go to war over a stolen bucket. Except actually during my research, it turns out the bucket may have been stolen after the war was over. It's kind of gets a little muddy there because it's a long time ago, but the, the point still stands. They were fighting for non nonsensical reasons, not very nice. Number six, the fashion police. You're wearing stripes, <laughs> ew. Don't you know polka dots are in? No, it was more like you're wearing stripes. The garment of the devil, get him. Call the guy who gets rid of people. Yes, wearing stripes could lead to your demise. In 1310 in the French town of Rune, a local cobbler was condemned to the end simply because he'd been caught in striped clothing. In 1295, Pope Boniface, nice name, the eighth, issued a papal decree banning religious orders from wearing any type of striped clothing. From the year 1250, the only people who could be caught wearing stripes were the ladies of the night, lepers and cripples as sort of a rebellious way of showing they were outsiders. How very punk. And I'm kind of wearing stripes right now, so uh-oh, call the medieval police, uh-oh. Number five, Revenge of the Slain. Vikings, you love them. We've talked about Vikings a few times here on this channel. You know what they're all about. Swords, longboats, pillaging, all that great stuff. Throw in some Norse mythology and you got yourself a textbook Viking. However, one story from the Vikings always reminds me to stay grounded. And like I always say, don't sniff your own farts. It's not good for you. Well, this is a story of arrogance. Sigurd the Mighty versus Bucktooth Brigtev. The battle ended with victory in Sigurd's corner and with Bucktooth's head on a string tied to Sigurd's horse. Sigurd was thinking of beautiful lasses, mead, and a chance to lay down and relax as he galloped on his way home. The trouble is, the head of Bucktooth had a buck tooth, that's why they gave him the name, and found its way into Sigurd's thigh. Now that wasn't enough to dethrone the mighty warrior, but however, it was enough to get him sick. Very sick, where he would actually succumb to his infection. Oof, awkward. Number four, Henry VIII. Divorced, beheaded, unalived, divorced, beheaded, survived. Do you ever get the title of defender of the faith for writing a treaty against a heretic and then just starting a religious revolution, creating a whole different church? I know, right? Just to be able to divorce your wife? <laughs> 
Did you ever do all this in the name of having a male son? Well, King Henry VIII of England did. Yes, that's right. We talked about him a few times here too. King Henry had six wives in total. They were Catherine of Aragon, Anne Boleyn, Jane Seymour, Anne of Cleves, Catherine Howard, and Catherine Parr. He clearly had a thing for Anne's and Catherine. Henry's dad, the seventh Henry, was king because of the War of the Roses, which was incredibly bloody to carry on the Tudor line. Number three, Sleeping General. William Wallace, great guy, good movie. A little overrated in my opinion, but still worth the watch. I just prefer my Mel Gibson and Lethal Weapons. Diplomatic immunity, you know what I'm saying? What do William Wallace and oversleeping have in common? Well, for those who had their moms rushing you out the door all the way up until you were 18, it can put a wrench in your plans. John D. Warren was in charge of defending against the Scottish Rebellion. He had his hands full, that's for sure. Wallace was no joke. So you can understand why in one battle, he overslept. His men began showing up, taking the lines, taking positions. Hey, but the boss wasn't there. Where's the boss? Have you seen the boss? Where is he? What's going on? Wallace, seeing an opportunity, seized it. And the Scots won the day and went on to fight for independence. The lesson here, when mom says get out of bed, you gotta get out of bed. Number two, tough interview. YouTube won't let me say the word, but it's when someone has certain information and another party wants said information. Now, when the information isn't coming out, you gotta get it out. Medieval times gave us a whole bunch of fun ways to extract information. If you went into a castle dungeon, you might find hammers, nails, knives, screws, rope, leather, whips, chains, pulleys, wheels, chairs, water, fire, oil, claws, grabbers, and maybe the most simple and famous, the rack, which is basically just a fancy table that you get stretched out on until thou can no longer be stretched anymore. You'd like to think it was used on criminals, but the truth is it was used on many people, including criminals. A lot of times it was innocent folks simply labeled as heretics and they would suffer from these tools of horror. Not cool, dude. Not cool. Not so great. Don't like that. Number one, Streets of Blood. The Crusades. Oh, baby, what an adventure those were, right? Super fun, awesome adventure time with all your favorite friends from church. That sounds like a great time. Well, sadly, it wasn't all fun and games. It was basically a holy war, and a lot of folks got uh, de-lifed. That's not very nice. One particular story talks about how during the Crusades, the streets of Jerusalem were flooded with the life of juice, the juice of life, the red Kool-Aid, the stuff that makes Chetty Queasy at night, blood. That's right, it said it was flooded with it. Each time a side in the Crusades did something heinous, it seems it was always returned with another heinous act. We've moved, we've, we've moved past that now, we've moved past that. <laughs> 